Way back in 2010, you'd be hard pressed to find any UFC fights online outside of illegal websites to stream them or just hitting up MMA core like a true fan. But one thing we did have was the golden age of YouTube highlight reels. And if you were just getting into the sport like me, guys like Baz Rutten and Mirko Krokop were absolutely mesmerizing to watch. Their destructive compilations were a shot of MMA secret juice mainlined to the veins of fans discovering the sport for the first time. But alongside their organ-busting kicks was another man, who in three minutes of limb-twisting, leg-strangling mayhem made submission fans out of thousands of the uninitiated. His flat-out aggressive pursuit of the submission took him to the heights of the pound-for-pound -pound list, and while the final war of Japanese vs US MMA raged, he emerged as another bad boy alongside the likes of the Diaz brothers, a skinny-looking guy whose cocky attitude polarized the MMA world with equal talent for masterful submissions and the Stockton salute. At a time when the guard game was considered dead in MMA, Aoki emerged as the most dangerous man off his back. This is a story of white-hot feuds, rivalry six years in the making, an unremorseful limb-snapping grapple machine and a cross-promotion championship event that had never been seen before in MMA history. This is Shinya Aoki, the Japanese Diaz brother. Chapter 1 – Traditional Beginnings our story starts in 1992, in the sprawling metropolitan streets of Shizuoka City nestled neatly on the southern coast of Japan. Its name means Calm Hills, but would produce one of the most violent grapplers to ever walk inside a ring. A nine-year-old Shinya Aoki is glued to the television screen, watching the Barcelona Olympic Games, where two men, Hidehiko Yoshida and Toshihiko Koga, battle through their brackets and make history as they win two gold medals in judo for Japan. These demonstrations of skill, technique, and national pride lit a fire inside the young Shinya, and on that very day, he decided he would begin his martial arts journey. He joined the judo club at his local school and received strict instruction by his sensei. If he lost in practice, he was struck by his master. The way he tells it, it happened a lot. The serious nature of this training installed this kill-or-be-kill attitude in Aoki, and he discovered his love for one-on-one -on -one competition, which would fuel a lifelong career of martial arts. His school taught a Kosen style of judo, which is one much more focused on submissions and groundwork, and after winning both national and international titles at a young age, he was ranked as high as number five in the sport, while still at high school. By university, he was ranked number two in Japan, and he joined the junior national team. But his love of the submission eventually led him to want to focus on a different kind of competition. One Japanese man had drawn the eyes of the entire combat sports world with his incredible performances of heart, technique, and pride, the legendary Kazushi Sakuraba. Aoki was once again inspired and wanted to get involved in BJJ and MMA. At the Perestra Shuto Gym, under the guise of another Japanese legend, Aoki began his transformation into one of the most deadly men on the planet. Stand by for more Japan Open Exhibition fights. Before Pride, before even the UFC had really begun to take off, the Valet Tudo tournaments of Japan in the early 90s drew martial artists from all around the world to compete in no holds barred competition. These events were born from the Japanese Shuto scene and didn't have things like weight classes. The first event in 1994 was a huge success with Hicks and Gracie winning, but in 1995, one man would enter representing Japan, outsized and outweighed by every single opponent he faced. His name, Yuki Nakai, a judo champion and shoot fighter who weighed just 135 pounds. 
His first fight of the night would be against a six foot five Gerard Gordeaux. In what became a bloody, grueling war, Gordeaux laid on the punishment, and when the ref didn't stop the fight, he eye gouged Yuki, giving him an injury that would leave him blinded in one eye for the rest of his life. I damaged him, him too much. And I said to the referee, you have to stop the fight, otherwise I do it. And I put the eye out. He's blind, okay. It's the fault of the referee. Nakai actually survived, and in the third round, he managed to lock in a heel hook, forcing the Dutchman to tap. Despite being basically blind in his right eye, he refused to quit and kept fighting. Going into the final, Yuki's eyes were nearly completely swollen shut. He fought Hicks and Gracie, who was far too injured to put up much of a fight. His eyesight never returned to his right eye, and he and his trainer Sayama kept his blindness a secret just to protect the image of the sport. He retired from MMA and eventually became the first Japanese man to receive a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It was then in 1997 he opened the Parestra Shuto Gym, and a few years later, where an eager Shinya Aoki walked through its doors, inspired by another Japanese legend ready to begin his own journey in mixed martial arts. Chapter 2 Tobikan Judan, the master of flying submissions. With his judo black belt already wrapped around his waist, he began studying BJJ and Shuto with Nakai, quickly advancing to the rank of A-class Shuto expert and eventually being awarded his black belt and a position teaching at the school. While still in college, he made his first steps into MMA, competing in a one-night tournament in deep. He submitted everyone in the first round with arm bars, but would also suffer his first professional loss by KO. Then, in 2004, at the Grappling Reversal Cup, the hardcore martial arts world took notice for the first time. Kuniyoshi Hironaka's arm was broken, and the master of flying submissions, the Tobikan Judan, had been born. He would then follow this performance up a few months later, making his first appearance in Shuto. And the American Keith Wisniewski was not prepared for what was in store. Aoki was collecting arms left and right. However, in August, Shinya would face his first major setback, and in one night at Shuto Alive Road, two historic rivalries would begin. For the first time, he would make Hayato Sakurai, and for the first time in his career, he would go the distance, and in a controversial judge's decision, Hayato would be declared the winner. The headliner that night would be future lightweight strike force champion and scrap pack member Gilbert Melendez, who was enjoying an undefeated career so far, but their appearance together on this card set the wheels of fate in motion for a truly historic matchup that would later define an era of MMA. Now a rising star on his way to the top, Aoki's next fight would be for the Shuto middleweight title. After a long battle with Akira Kikuchi, Shinya won his first fight by decision and the championship belt. But at just 23 years old and still in university, his future in the sport was unclear. He admitted that the cash prize was minimal, even as a champion. It certainly wasn't enough for him to make a living, and so in a move that surprised everyone, one of the hottest new prospects in Japan left the sport entirely to start a completely different career. A month after winning the title, Aoki graduated from university and his next choice was to go into the police force in his home city telling media outlets he wanted to defend Japan. This would require six months of training and as an officer of the law he would not be able to compete in the sport. After just two months though, pictures began to emerge of him at the Twist Gym and by June 15th he announced that after experiencing the real world he'd realised how important it was for him to live life as a martial artist. Pride reached out with an offer, and Japan's next big thing was headed back to the ring. This is truly when Aoki's reign of submissive terror began. Chapter 3 Pride Fighting Championships 
In August 2006, he made his first appearance at Bushido 12, squaring off against the cult icon Jason Black, who'd been on one of the greatest win streaks in MMA history. Shinya wasted no time pulling guard and slapping on a deadly triangle, forcing Black to tap in just under two minutes. It was a hell of a way to make a return to the sport. Aoki wins his debut in very impressive fashion. Earlier that night, though, on the other side of the world, coincidentally, Nick Diaz also picked up a submission of the night, tapping Josh Near in the UFC. Nick But it was his teammate Gilbert Melendez who also fought at Pride Bushido 12. Two months earlier, he'd beaten Clay Guida and claimed the Strike Force lightweight title. The night of Bushido 12, he won a unanimous decision over Nobuhiro Obia, taking him to 11-0 in his career. And that very same night, for the first time, El Nino and the Tobacan Judan were matched to fight. But sadly, it would never happen. At least, not yet. Gilbert received a burst bursa sack in his elbow while training and had to pull out. This USA-Japan showdown would have to wait. Meanwhile, Shinya fought Clay French and reminded everyone why they call him the Tobacan Judam. He nailed him with a flying triangle in just four minutes. He grabbed a hot mic and called Gilbert into the ring and they agreed that at the upcoming New Year's show we'd finally get the lightweight matchup we'd all been waiting for. I apologize for not fighting, but I want New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. Gilbert was the Strike Force champion. Shinya was doing things in Pride we'd never seen before. Everyone wanted to see it, but once again, it just didn't happen. Four weeks before the event, Gilbert was contacted and told his opponent had been changed. It was around this time as well that Shinya had begun reportedly training with Eddie Bravo, wanting to learn more about his rubber guard system. Eddie has long praised Shinya as one of the only guys in MMA capable of securing submissions off his back, maybe helped by his fantastical tights, and Aoki began to add his judo, BJJ, and shooto skills with a bit of that magical 10th planet jujitsu. Then, an epic end-of-year showdown took place at Pride Shockwave 2006, and both Shinya and Gilbert fought on the card, but once again, not against each other. In what would be another legendary submission and start of another career rivalry, Aoki took on the Norwegian standout, the highly ranked and former Shuto champion, Joaquin Hansen. But in just over two minutes, he shocked the entire MMA world when he worked his rubber guard and locked up a go-go plata, the second ever in MMA history. That shit hit the MMA forums like a Joe Rogan Photoshop contest, and he pulled it off just two months before Nick would hit his own go-go against Gomi later at Pride 33. Nick would actually go on to talk about Shinya. That's why I was, you know, I always wanted to fight uh, Shinyoki. He was, uh, I don't want to say I was a Shinyoki fan, it's just that I felt like he got out and was able to do a lot of, a lot of the tricks that I like to do before I was able to do them, and I was, uh, I guess you could say, uh, a little bit jealous in a way. And you know what? There's many more similarities between these two guys. Not only were they both finishing opponents with displays of complete mastery of their skill sets, but both had the same attitude to the sport. We know the Diaz brothers only count submissions and KOs as wins. Shinya has also said the same. When talking about BJ losing his title to Frankie Edgar, he'd say, <laughs> And the Diaz attitude of kill or be killed? Yeah, Aoki had that in spades, telling media at points, I can risk my life if needs be. Fighting isn't about technique, but about instinct and heart. One tough guy will stand, another tough guy will fall. On the same night Shinya pulled off the Gogo Plata, Gilbert managed to pull off a unanimous decision over Kawajiri. And despite even the commentators talking about it after his hand was raised, Shinya and Gilbert would not be matched up. In fact, Gilbert would never compete in Pride again. In the wake of the Zufa purchase, Pride faded into memory and Shinya was set on a new path to glory. Chapter 4 Living the Dream much of the MMA world mourned Pride's passing, and let's face it, they still do. But some of the company's executives in association with FEG, the fighting and entertainment group, and M1 Global, the Russian promotion, decided they should put on one final massive event to say farewell to Pride. They named it Yaranoka. I know most of you know the big Pride stars, Krokop, Vandalay, of course, Fedor, but you know who headlined the farewell show? Yeah, they picked Shinya Aoki. And if you didn't know how big a star he was, well, now you know. 
Fedor fought Hongman Choi. Once again, Gil came back on the same card as Aoki, but not against him, and would be handed his first ever loss at the hands of the judges. Shinya then headlined the event against a judo silver medalist who stepped in after the K1 Heroes champion pulled out, and all the fighters gathered in the ring after the countdown of the new year to say a final goodbye to Pride. Just as we thought Japanese MMA might be done forever, a slow chant rose from the hardcore fan base. Pride never dies. Pride never dies. Due to overwhelming support and petitioning, FEG and former Pride staff came together to start a brand new promotion. It was announced early in the winter of 2008. They called it Dream. You really thought they'd go away that easy? They even continued their partnership with M1 Global and they secured television coverage on HDNet in the US. Dream 1 was their inaugural show, and they kicked off a lightweight Grand Prix, and guess who headlined it? Of course, the Tobikan Judan, rebooked against the K1 Heroes champion, but it wasn't the showcase Shinya was hoping for, as he was stopped with illegal elbows in the first round. Down the back of his head, which is illegal, you can't elbow the, can't elbow the head, but... Not exactly a breakout performance. They rematched just one month later, however, and this time Aoki took a unanimous decision. Then in his next bout, he'd pull off something truly spectacular. Just when the MMA world thought they'd seen it all, Aoki hit a mounted Gogo Plata, the first of its kind in any major promotion. That set him up for the final showdown of the lightweight Grand Prix, the semis and the finals being decided in a one-night tournament on July 21st, 2008. And at this point, Aoki was ranked the number three lightweight on the planet. It would be Aoki's fourth and fifth fight in just four months, and the paths of Nick Diaz and Aoki will almost look to cross and compete on the same event as Nick was supposed to fight for the inaugural title, but the Stockton man pulled out due to contract obligations with Elite XC. After an incredibly grueling grappling battle with MMA legend Carl Uno, Aoki just had an hour and a half to recover before he's walking out to the finals against former foe, the Norwegian Joaquin Hansen. Destiny had led him to this moment, to claim another title, the biggest in Japanese MMA in the brand new promotion to become the inaugural champion, but sadly, it was not meant to be. And we shall see, the championship is on, the dream is about to become real for either Aoki or Hansen. Hansen swings and misses and Aoki grabs him and wants to get it to the ground naturally and he does. This is what Aoki wants. This is exactly the game plan that Aoki has followed there to perfection. Go. Hansen now able to get free. Uh, he knew that it was going to come, and he knew it was real easy out. <laughs> Hansen tries to come in with hey! the Superman, and he delivers a good punch. He has Aoki up. in trouble. Hansen, he's got it. him. He's done I told it. He's done it. Joachim Hansen knocks out Aoki. Aoki was undoubtedly devastated, losing is hard enough, but this felt like a title he was just meant to win. But just four months later, he was already back in the ring, looking better than ever. Aoki wanting to get it to the ground. Has the back. Got the headlock on it at the moment. Well, that's it. Aoki can make it happen quickly. But for me, I want to be the best in the world. I want to be I want to be the best in the world at what I do. Eddie Alvarez was, at the time, 15-1 and one as a pro fighter. In fact, he'd just beaten Joaquin Hansen in the Dream Lightweight Grand Prix. The night of the finals, he TKO'd Tatsuya Kawajiri in brutal fashion, but had to pull out of the finals against Shinya as he picked up an injury. That's when Hansen stepped in. But at the 2008 New Year Dynamite show, they rebooked them to face each other in what should have been for the final and the inaugural belt in the first place, the master of the rubber guard versus the Philly Street Fighter. It was truly a New Year's to be thankful for, but no one expected it to go down the way it did. <laughs> It took only 90 seconds and Shinya Aoki was once again one of the best lightweights in the world. In fact, this fight had been for the first WA MMA lightweight title, a belt that was supposed to crown an undisputed champion regardless of promotion. 
2009 rolled around, and although the year had its ups and downs, he rematched Joaquin Hansen and finally claimed the dream title he felt destined to capture. A couple of months later, in December, BJ Penn defended his title in the UFC for a record-breaking third time, and Joe Rogan had this to say in the fourth round of a truly dominant performance. Maybe we need to steal Aoki from Japan. <laughs> But before the year was out, Shinya had one final showdown to attend and a shocking rivalry that polarized the entire MMA community. As with any new year came another epic Japanese MMA show and Dynamite 2009 was no different. When the press conference rolled around, however, it was clear the animosity between Shinya Aoki and Mizuto Hirota was far greater than expected. He even told him to shut up and to stop talking at the press conference, feeling disrespected by the short notice opponent change. Hirota was being pretty disrespectful with his own words and he just spectacularly dispatched Aoki's teammate. He promised the Dream President that he would take him out, and he was supposed to have been fighting fellow Dream Fighter Tatsuyura Kawajiri, but now he's up against the Sengoku Lightweight Champion. To further add to the intensity of this fight, the card itself had been an all Dream vs Sengoku showdown, and since Alistair Overeem had just crossed through Jida in over a minute, that meant it was four wins apiece, and it all came down to Aoki vs Hirota. And in a move that shocked the MMA world, he took absolutely no mercy. Hirota refused to tap and Shinya spared nothing in his celebration. His performance dominated the headlines of MMA media the following week. Some called for disciplinary action from the promotion, others saying simply it was one of the dirtiest things in MMA history. But Aoki regretted absolutely nothing, simply stating, he was very disrespectful to me before the fight, he had a chance to tap and he chose not to. I'm not going to give up the submission because my opponent is too arrogant, so I broke his arm. I think it was more the Stockton salute that most people had a problem with. He did eventually apologize, but as a result, Nakai dismissed him as a trainer from his gym. The hype surrounding this New Year's Eve card finish would propel him into 2010 with even more stakes on the line, this time carrying the legacy of Japanese MMA on his shoulders as he traveled overseas for the first time. Chapter 5 USA vs Japan During the heights of pride, there was always an ongoing debate within the MMA community about which promotion truly had the best fighters. They were also, without a doubt, the two largest markets for the sport. There was even a time it was announced that Sakuraba and Fujita would be making their way to the UFC, and Chuck went over to compete in the Pride Middleweight Grand Prix. The Iceman did his part, but uh, the Japanese fighters never did make their way to the US. And even when Pride was purchased by the UFC, a lot of the fighters didn't have proper contracts. It worked nothing like Dana and the boys were running their promotion, and many of their big names just went elsewhere. But there was one man who'd already been working alongside Japanese promoters since his kickboxing days. And with his connections from K1 Promotions, Scott Coker was able to sign a deal never before seen in MMA history. He sat down with the heads of Dream to finally bring the fans the matchup they'd been waiting nearly six years for. It would be champion versus champion, a unification of three of the biggest titles in MMA. The Strikeforce lightweight champion Gilbert Melendez and Dream and Shuto champion Shinya Aoki would finally meet after nearly crossing paths several times in the last decade. And it was going to happen in the US. Funnily enough though, one champion from Dream had already made their way over just four months earlier, Marius Zoromskis, and guess who welcomed him to America? Zoromskis' legs are gone, they're absolutely wild! And now it was his teammate's turn, Gil Melendez, to defend Strike Force's honor. But unlike Marius, Aoki was a Japanese fighter, born and bred, had held pretty much every major title possible in Japan, and was also the highest ranked pound for pound fighter from Japan at the time. He was number two in the lightweight rankings behind only BJ Penn, and he had a win over the current Bellator champion, Eddie Alvarez. It made for an international matchup, the likes of which we'd never seen before. Ariel Hawani at Strike Force Nashville with the Dream Lightweight Champion Shinya Aoki. It's unbelievable. You know, he's coming to the US to fight me. I mean, it says something about him. He's, a, he's like the biggest star in Japan coming here to fight me. I mean, that's, that shows some confidence. Is it safe to assume that the winner of this fight 
could be considered the top lightweight in the world. That's Shinya Aoki, who's a, you know, a killer, the dream champion of him because they know him. He's a hardcore fighter. The fight was going to be on CBS and it would be going out to 4.5 million homes nationwide. But Aoki made it clear that this was about Japanese MMA versus American MMA. He went so far as to say if Japan lost, they would become a colony for US martial arts. Gil had been training hard with Nick, who apparently uncharacteristically had been on time to every training session, and would himself be going to Japan to fight Sakurai the following month. So with the hype across the MMA community reaching a fever pitch, it all went down at the Strike Force Nashville card. Nick would submit Sakurai in the first round a month later, and almost single-handedly, the Scrap Pack, the guys who had spent their early careers overseas competing in Japan, had set the sun on the last era of Japanese MMA. But things weren't for Aoki. Across the next five years of competition, he'd pick up 16 more wins, 10 of them by submission, losing only once when he went to Bellator to fight Eddie Alvarez. He'd then go on to capture the one lightweight championship, and across his now 19-year-long MMA career, he spent 10 and a half years as a champion, holding four major world titles. And he's still competing. It is, though, perhaps not all that surprising that after his loss to Gilbert Melendez and Eddie Alvarez and his removal from the top of the pound-for-pound -pound list, that Dream would go on to have just one more event before shutting their doors completely. It was far more symbolic than it was literal, but their fallen star Aoki, after his legendary streak and years at the top, was no longer truly one of the best in the world, and the collapse of Japanese MMA that happened all around him truly shows how much he meant to that community. Being a true specialist in one area of combat sports has almost completely died out in MMA, but the legend of the Tobikan Judan will always live on. A man with a killer submission instinct since his early days as a young judoka, and a highlight reel that continues to make people who have only ever enjoyed knockouts fans of the art of submission.